Good morning. My name is Trevor. I am the director of traditional music here at First Broad Street. It's so good to see all of you here today. If you're a visitor with us today, uh, we are so glad you're here. Uh, if you have any questions about our ministries, about Sunday school, about our worship opportunities, I hope you'll grab any of our ushers after worship. You can speak to Randy or me or Rick, and we'd be happy to answer any of the questions you might have. And be sure to stop by the Welcome Center on the way out. We do have a special gift for you. I want to share with you the first seven verses of Psalm 95 as found in the message. Come, let's shout praises to God. Raise the roof for the rock who saved us. Let's march into his presence singing praises, lifting the rafters with our hymns. And why? Because God is the best high king over all. In one hand, he holds deep caves and caverns. In the other hand, he grasps the high mountains. He made the ocean. He owns it. His hands sculpted the earth. So come, let us worship. Bow before him on your knees, to, before God who made us. Oh yes, he's our God, and we're his people. We are the people he pastures, the flock he feeds. Friends, I invite you to stand and let's worship together, singing hymn 103, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. <laughs> Join me in our affirmation of faith. It comes from the United Church of Canada. It's found in your bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, whose works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
welcome the children forward for our children's time. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome, welcome. It's so good to see your faces this morning. We are so glad you are here today. You bring smiles to our faces and joy to our hearts. And God made you very, very special. Okay, so today we're going to talk about listening. Raise your hand if you feel like you're a pretty good listener. Okay, awesome. Turn your faces this way. Braden and Maddie, y'all come over this way, okay? You might fall right there. Thank you. Oh, good choice. Thank you, Braden. Maddie, come on over this way. Good job. We don't want anybody to fall, do we? Okay, we're going to play a game about listening first. So I'm going to play a noise on my phone, and you guys are going to guess what it is. Are you ready? Okay. Here we go. It's a cat. That's nice. That's right. Okay, here's the next one. These guys can guess. I want you to see it. <laughs> oh, you guys are good listeners. All right, another one's coming. Are you ready? A cow. Good. Good. Okay, here's the next one. These guys are really good at this game. Chicken, right? Okay, let's do one more. Are you ready? Okay, let's do one more. It's sheep. It's sheep. Good. That's right. Okay, we'll do one more. Since you're so good at it. Ready? Okay, one more. The horse. Very good. Okay, I need everybody to come close. Rachel, come close. Come close, Stella. Come close. Yeah, that one is a horse. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to play one more game. This one is a little bit harder. Are you ready? If you hear me say the word listen, I want you to pat your head. Okay? We're going to practice. We're going to practice. See what good listeners we have. Are you ready? Okay, Cahill and Brayden, I need you all to come over this way. Okay? I want everybody on the steps over here. I want everybody to be good listeners because we're to the important part. Okay, are you ready? All right, we're going to practice. Okay, the Bible says in James 1.19, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. What are we supposed to do? Slow to speak and slow to become angry. So the reason I wanted us to practice listening today, oh good, Rachel, you did it, good. Listening today is that we need to be sure to be good listeners to God. So why is it important to listen to what God says? Because God is here to help us and to always show us the right and good way. God wants the best for us. There's lots of things in this world to listen to, but the best thing to listen to is who? God. Oh, very good. You guys are listening, aren't you? You heard that. So how can we listen to God? There are lots of ways God speaks to us. We can hear him by reading the Bible, can't we? We can hear him by listening in church and in Sunday school. We can listen to our parents, right? And we can pray every day. Do you guys pray to your parents? Or pray, pray every day to God? I do. You do? I'm so glad. I'm so glad because not only can we talk to God when we pray, we can listen, right? Okay, so we're going to do a prayer right now. Can you guys show me how you pray? Can you show Miss Katie? Dear God, we thank you so much for being there for us and wanting the best for us, Lord. We ask that you would help us to listen to you 
We thank you for listening to us, Lord. Help us to be good listeners. And we thank you for speaking to us, Lord. We ask all this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you for being good listeners today. We'll go to Godly Play. Before we have our morning prayer together, just want to mention three concerns of our church family. Uh, first of all, Jerry Tustin had surgery earlier this week or, or late last week, and uh, he remains hospitalized, recovering. Uh, we want to extend our sympathy to Carolyn Kingdon and her family in the death of her brother, and to Tibby Tesfianis on the death of her son earlier last week. I know that all of us come to church with concerns and sometimes with a lot of struggles. And so I want you to know this altar is open to anyone who would like to come and join us here at the altar as we join together in morning prayer. Gracious God, how good it is to be in your house. To know that in spite of the scars and blemishes of life, and the reminders of our failures, that you welcome us here. That you meet us here with a saving and a renewing embrace. And that you pour out grace upon grace to meet every need. So today, O oh God, we gather here that we might experience the power of your love once more. We come especially remembering those in need for prayers for Jerry and prayers for Carolyn and for Tibby. Prayers for all of those who are recovering from surgeries and those who are going through seasons of grief. Our prayer is that you would be their comfort, their great physician, and the healer of the bodies, their minds, and their spirits. We offer our prayers for this church, that we would be faithful, people of bold vision, people that, that are committed to making a difference in the name of Jesus in our community and around this world. Hear our prayers for the poor and the hurting and the hungry. May they find comfort, and may your church be the vessels through which that comfort appears. We pray today, O oh God, for this nation and for all nations of this world, that in every seat of government that you would reign and that your righteousness and your justice would be pursued by all. Help us to work towards that day when peace governs every heart. As we continue in worship, we pray for the leading of your Holy Spirit, the Spirit that inspires us and sometimes convicts us, but always draws us closer to you. Open our hearts and minds to that presence, that we may go forth from here a renewed people. These things we ask in Jesus' name.
remembering how He taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25 tells us that a generous man will prosper. He, will, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. God has been most generous to us. As the ushers come forward, please give generously to his church. We thank you for all of your gifts, O oh God. And with these plates, we return a portion of our own. 
and along with these gifts, we offer you anew our hearts and our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination found in your bulletin. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from 2 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 12 and 31 through 33. David now mustered the men who were with him and appointed generals and captains to lead them. He sent the troop out, troops out in three groups, placing one group under Joab, one, num, one under Joab's brother, Abishai, son of Zeriah, and one under Ittai, the man from Gath. The king told his troops, I'm going with you. But his men objected strongly. You must not go, they urged. If we have to turn and run, and even if half of us die, it will make no difference to Absalom's troops. They will be looking only for you. You are worth 10,000 of us, and it is better that you stay here in the town and send help if we need it. If you think that's the best plan, I'll do it, the king answered. So he stood alongside the gate of the towns as all the troops marched out in groups of hundreds and of thousands. And the king gave this command to Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, for my sake deal gently with the young Absalom. And all the troops heard the king give this order to his commanders. So the battle began in the forest of Ephraim, and the Israelites troops were beaten back by David's men. There was a great slaughter that day, and 20,000 men lay down their lives. The battle raged all across the countryside, and more men died because of the forest than were killed by the sword. During the battle, Absalom happened to come upon some of David's men. He tried to escape on his mule, but as he rode beneath the thick branches of a great tree, his hair was caught in the tree. The mule kept going and left him dangling in the air. One of David's men saw what had happened and told Joab, I saw Absalom dangling from a great tree. What? Joab demanded. You saw him and you didn't kill him? I would have rewarded you with ten pieces of silver and a hero's belt. I would not king kill the king's son for even a thousand pieces of silver, the man replied to Joab. We all heard the king say to you and Abishai and Ittai, for my sake, Please spare young Absalom. Then a man from Ethiopia arrived and said, I have good news for my lord the king. Today the Lord has rescued you from all those who rebelled against you. What about young Absalom, the king demanded? Is he all right? And the Ethiopian replied, May all your enemies, my lord the king, both now and in the future, suffer the fate of that young man. The king was overcome with emotion. He went up to the room over the gateway and burst into tears. As he went, he cried, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. As we prepare our hearts and minds for the message this morning, I invite you to stand with me and sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of hymn number 337, Only Trust Him.
And as you're being seated, if you would reach out and grab the hand of the person sitting next to you, let's join hands as we join together in prayer. In these moments, O oh God, open our hearts and our minds that we might hear your word afresh. Speak to us at our points of need, for we, your servants, are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. When, uh, when Aaron and Will were young, we did a lot of reading with them, and, and I guess like most children, they loved Dr. Seuss. And one of our favorite books to read was um, uh, one entitled, Oh, the Places You'll Go. Anybody else ever read that one? Yeah, well, you didn't come to church today expecting to hear from Dr. Seuss, so this is a surprise. But I want you to listen to these words. Congratulations, today's your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. Your own, your own. You know what you know. And you are the one who will decide where to go. Then he adds this warning. You'll look up and down streets. Look them over with care. About some you will say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down a not-so-good street. Be it far from me to disagree with Dr. Seuss, but it's been my experience that we're not that smart. Because a lot of times when we stand or find ourselves at a crossroads of life, the choice we make winds up being a not so good street. And the results, the destination is not what we expected. I, I, I mentioned that because this 18th chapter of 2 Samuel concludes our look at David's story. And it's a very sad account of the death of Absalom. But that story, that chapter is, is filled with people who make choices and wind up going down not too good streets. You see, the problem is when you and I find ourselves at a crossroads, and we're trying to figure out which way we're going to go, what are we going to do, there are a lot of voices that vie for our attention and seek our adherence. And too often, it is those voices that determine the choices we make. So today, I want us to, to be thinking about how to listen to the right voice and to do so by reflecting upon this chapter in 2 Samuel. Let's begin by, by simply taking a look at the participants in the drama, and we'll start with David. Now, we've heard it said many times, he is a man after God's own heart. But we know that David, like all of us, was a flawed character. And there were times in his life when he listened to voices and chose not-so-good streets, not the least of which was the episode with Bathsheba. Because at that, it, at that episode, David chose not to listen to the words of his advisors. Instead, David chose to listen to the voices of lust, of self-indulgence, and then of self-preservation. David listened to the voices that, pro that promoted power without restraint and privilege without boundaries. And we know that at the end, it was unpleasant for everybody involved. And now it seems like 
Nathan's ominous warning is indeed playing itself out. Because Nathan had said to him, that the sword will never leave your house. By the time we get to chapter 18, two of David's sons have died. Absalom has led this revolt. And uh, uh, the peace that David created, that David built among the people, it is threatened as is their unity. Everything that David had, had worked for is threatened at this point. And unfortunately, so much of it is the direct consequences of a choice he made long ago and a path that he decided to follow. It was not so good. And then there is David's son, Absalom. When you think of him in this story, there are clearly two voices that have gotten his attention. The voice of vengeance and the voice of ambition. We're introduced to Absalom in the story in which his sister Tamar is raped by their half-brother. And, and Absalom is incensed. And he's determined that he's going to make Amnon pay for what he's done. But Absalom's a pretty shrewd cookie. And he knows he can't do anything right then. But he waits and he stews and he plans his revenge for two whole years. And then he invites all of David's sons to a big party. And when Amnon's had too much to drink, he orders his servants to kill him. He exacted his revenge for what Amnon had done, but it doesn't bring peace or satisfaction. It doesn't fix anything. It breaks David's heart. It results in Absalom being cast into exile. It was a not so good street. The other voice was the voice of ambition. For while he's in exile, he has one thought. He's going to return. He's going to take his father's throne. And he listens to the voices that say, David's weak. Or the voices that say, the people don't trust David's leadership any longer. Or the voices that said, you will have no problem generating the support of the people and the, and the armies will turn against David. None of that. None of that was true. And it led to that awful moment where Absalom is caught hanging from a tree by his hair. And I'm pretty sure that's a not so good street. And then there's Joab. Joab is David's loyal, trusted, dependable commander. Whenever David's in a fix, he turns to Joab. Joab's the one that helped plan and carry out the, uh, the scheme to get rid of Bathsheba's husband when David was frantically trying to cover his sin. And it's Joab who served as the mediator between David and Absalom when Absalom was in, uh, was in exile. And now it's to Joab that David will turn since the revolt has taken place. But Joab, he doesn't really want to listen to the voice and the instruction of his king. Instead, he would rather listen to a voice that says, I must at all cost preserve the, the throne for David. And I know more than David does about this. And so I realize that the only way to, to make the throne safe and secure Eliminate the threat completely. And the threat will exist as long as Absalom lives. So I'm going to get rid of him. It is that voice, not the voice of David, that gets his allegiance and that leads his actions. But again, it doesn't make the throne or the nation safe and secure. 
It does not bring joy to David or or relief from David. It breaks his heart. It creates separation in the relationship between Joab and David. It further creates instability among God's people. It's a not so good place. Three people, all of them choosing to listen or or willing to listen to voices of their own choosing, not one of them stopping to ask, what does God want? What is right and just in this moment? all of them winding up on a not-so-good street. But there's a fourth person in this story. We don't have his name. He's a soldier, an unnamed soldier. He's the one who found Absalom hanging from the tree and ran back to tell Joab. He's the only one that had a sense of what was right that had a sense of higher calling guiding his steps, that listened to a voice above violence or above vengeance or above reward. And when he met with Joab, and Joab asked, did you kill him? And he said, no. And Joab asked, why not? It's there that we learn the, the, the secret of the right voice, listening to the right voice. Because he says to Joab, in the king's presence, I heard the king's command. Now folks, when we're in a time of decision, when we're in a time of crisis, When we want to know which way do we go forward, first and foremost, you and I need to learn how to listen to the king's command. And if we're going to do that, there are four keys that we must remember. The first one is this. you got to be present. You remember... How Jesus once said, my sheep know my voice. Sheep know a shepherd's voice for the simple fact the shepherd is out there in the fields with the sheep. They spend time in the shepherd's presence. This one man did the right thing because he was in the king's presence. And if you and I are going to make good decisions, right decisions, choose correct paths, then you and I must be intentional about being in our king's presence. The best way I know how is to be intentional about what Wesley called the means of grace, the sacraments, doing what we're doing this morning, worshiping together, taking time to not just to read quickly, but to search the scriptures, taking time to to pray and in prayer, close our mouth and open our ears, to take time to seek holy counsel, wise counsel from those whom we trust and those who themselves are growing in their faith. When you and I, the more time that you and I spend in the presence of the king, we're going to recognize the voice of the king. And I believe we'll be able to trust the king enough to follow. The second thought is is to be open. To be open-minded. Here's the problem. Neither... Neither Absalom or Joab had an open mind about anything except what they thought was best. Only this unnamed soldier thought murder might not be best here. 
even if he's, a, even if he's an e easy target, this isn't right because of what the king said. I don't know if any of you all are guilty of this, but I've discovered along the way that, that when I make those choices that wind up on not-so-good streets, more times than not, it's the result of this, the fact that when I'm praying, Lord, show me the way, help me to choose, in the back of my mind, I've already made the decision. But in the back of my mind, I know what I want. And, and I tell myself, I know what's best. I just hope God does. <laughs> well, the truth is, God does know what's best. And what I've had to learn the hard way, not a few times, is that I have to approach God with an openness and a willingness to move in directions I did not perceive may not always understand. In fact, may not completely want. But I do it because I trust the one who created me. I think the most open moment in all of the scripture is that moment on the night when Jesus was betrayed, when he's alone in the garden, and you hear him, Father, is there any way to let this cup pass from me? That's brutal honesty. That's Jesus saying, I'm not ready. I don't want to do this. I've only been with these disciples three years. There's so much more to say. There's so much more to do. There are so many lives that still need to be healed and need to be, need to be raised up to a new life. It's brutal honesty. Is there any way to let this cup pass? But even more honest and more glorious is the fact that Jesus immediately says, nevertheless, it's not about what I want. It's about what you want, Father. Nevertheless, let thy will be done. I hope that I will always be that open. Lord, let your will be done. And that honest. And honesty is the third key. Because, let's face it, many of the problems we encounter and the bad decisions we make are the direct result that we are neither honest with ourselves or honest with God. There's a whole lot of deception in this, in this story. David had moments of deception, but certainly Absalom deceived his father. He told his father he wanted to go to Hebron to, to, to worship there as he'd promised God, but that wasn't the case. He went to Hebron to start a revolution. And, and Joab deceives David. Because Joab promises that I'll do what you say, but he has no intention of doing that. He's going to eliminate Absalom at all costs. It's been my experience that when I'm not honest about what I'm feeling, when I'm not honest about my fears, when I'm not honest about what I want, that, that, that before long I find myself ignoring what God may be saying because of my fears and my wishes and my wants. The critical piece is always being honest with self, honest with God. This is where I am because it's only when we admit where we are that God can lead us into a better place and a new life. Well, there's one more word, and it's the word courageous. It took a lot of courage for this soldier not to kill a vulnerable Absalom because he knew that he would face the ire of his commander. But he had the courage to do what the king desired and to do 
what was right. The question is, when you and I stand at the crossroads of decision, do we have the courage to decide for what is right? The courage to do what's right. When, when, when culture tells us that uh, it's a wrong way, or, or the courage to do what's right when everybody else around us says that's foolishness. The, the courage to do what is right when we can't see the way that it'll be done. The courage to trust God enough that we'll place our hands into His hand and dare to go forth with Him. Thomas Merton uh, a writer of some of the spiritual classics, a Catholic priest, was going through a, a time of great spiritual uncertainty and, and uh, depression. And I want you to hear a prayer that he wrote. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I can't even see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. But I hope that I will never do anything apart from the desire to know you and to please you. And I believe that if I do that, you will lead me by the right road. So I will trust you. Even though I might be lost in the shadow of death, I will not fear because I know you are with me. And you would never leave me, alone, leave me to face the peril alone. Well, my friends, my prayer for me and for you is that when we stand at our own crossroads and we are trying to make a decision, that we will be open and honest and present, listening. Because if we do, God will lead us along the right road. And, uh, and we would never be in a road not so good. And oh, I can only imagine that with God, the places we will go. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. And if there's anybody here today and, and, and you've never experienced a personal relationship with Jesus or or maybe there's somebody here today and you're at that crossroads and you're trying to figure out where to go and there's a lot of voices vying for your attention and you just need some prayer. Well, whatever the need is, I'll be here at the altar. I'll be glad to pray with you. Let's stand together as we sing.
right before we went into worship this morning, I heard Trevor saying to the choir, and I couldn't quite make it out that there was a key or something that was sticking on the organ. I, I think we all know now, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> so. But I must say, in spite of that, it was a joyful noise hearing you. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was. What a great song. And now may the grace of God, love that he revealed to us in Christ Jesus, and the equipping, inspiring, and guiding presence of the Holy Spirit lead all of us into the life that is abundant and eternal. Amen. Thank you.